So uh, welcome everybody. My name is Henry Hale and I'm Professor of Political Science and International Affairs as well as Director for our Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies here at George Washington University and its Elliott School of International Affairs. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome, uh, to speak to us, uh, Stefan Lindbergh, who is the, uh, like a, one of the renowned experts around the world on issues related to democracy and democratization. Um, and so he's here to present the most recent product, which is, I guess, is the title up here. So anyway, the Democracy Report 2024. Um, he is the uh, director of the uh, Varieties of Democracy Project um, and the director of the Institute, uh, by Varieties of Democracy Institute at the University of Gothenburg. I had the pleasure of visiting. It was a great experience. They got a great team of people who've been doing lots of amazing work um, utilizing data and collecting data around the world. So I think without further ado, let me just turn things over to you and you can um, lead us off with a presentation and then we'll use the rest of the time for discussion. Sure. And uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting me here again. Um, and um, yeah, let me do this. I, so uh, this year's Democracy Report, de Democracy Winning and Losing at the Ballot. Winning because democracy is winning in some places, like Brazil, recently at the ballot. But also losing at the ballot, as you know, many processes of autocratization start with, uh, uh, with a ballot, bringing um, someone into power, a party, and leader that then undermine democracy. And now, elections, one of the things we see in the report, I'll come back to that, is that elections increasingly is being undermined, uh, something that we haven't seen in the data before. But also reflecting a bit that we're learning more and more about autocratization episodes. And this year we also have a new methodology for identifying countries and tracking them over episodes of autocratization and democratization. Um, that also makes it possible for us to see new things uh, and we the picture is becoming more complex and I hope this year's report reflects some of that. It has five sections. I'm gonna give you some highlights from each of the five sections. Start with democracy in the world. You guys know this, right? Democracy is in decline. We can look at it in different ways. Right? So here's uh, this graph you have the liberal democracy index, the world average the last 50 years, the wave of democratization, and then um, going south. But, it, you know, it's still, if you draw a line here, it's back to 1998 in terms of world average, but it's within the confidence intervals and so on. Now, <clears throat> country averages, you often see that metric being used. People don't always think about it, but it's also a way of weighting. Right? You just weigh on a government, one government over a territory, no matter what. Which means, among other things, that in that average, the seashells with 90,000 inhabitants out there in the Indian Ocean weigh as much as India with 1.4 billion in terms of portraying how much democracy there is in the world. But we think of, I mean, we know democracy is supposed to be ruled by the people. So we think it matters how many people are affected by having more or less of democratic rights and freedoms. So another metric that will capture that more is the population weight. By this metric, you see the decline is much, much greater. And if we draw a line back, we end up in 1985. Of course, the world is not back to 1985. No country is back to 1985. We, we, are, we are here today, 2024. Um, and some countries are better off on democracy than they were in 85. Uh, you know all about that, the Eastern European countries. Um, and, but some countries are worse off. Another perspective, territory, how much of the world in terms of territory have what level of rights, again, the downward slope is uh, greater than the country average, which tells you that over this now long period, maybe the last 20 years or so, 
the countries that have declined on democracy are populous and also territory-wise uh, rather big. Uh, but look at this, weighted by GDP. That metric telling you something about how much democracy is losing in the world in terms of economic power. Um, so, you know, different metrics, similar sort of picture, although with this uh, country weighted average a uh, lot less. We use the population weighted a lot because we focus on democracy. Um, and um, by that metric, we've had at least 15 years where the country is sliding down on democracy, greatly outweighing uh, the democratizing countries in terms of population, how many people are affected. I know Freedom House talks about, in their report this year, 18 years of consecutive declines. This says 15 years. I'm going to show you some metrics also I already talked about, maybe 20 years. Could also be 30 years of decline, depending on which which way you slice the data. <coughs> but we take the some underlying data, as in the Liberal Democracy Index, it has 48 indicators. Um, and we aggregate it up in this more simplified category, categorization or typology, building on Larry Diamond's early work and then Andreas Chandler and others sort of became sort of a solidified conceptual apparatus that we take on and measure um, the close autocracies to the liberal democracies. And you sh I mean, it's a simplification of reality of this electoral autocracy box, for example, um, where countries hold multi-party elections, at least on paper. So the upcoming elections in Russia are technically multi-party. Russia is somewhere here, sort of weird, uh, border at the bottom end. But uh, at the upper end, you sort of have countries like Orban's Hungary. Um, and, and so it's a pretty wide box, right? Uh, simplifying a lot. And then in, now we also make use of this year um, the uncertainty measures in the VDEM data. They actually exist for all these categories, but for the report, when we look at this, dividing democracies and autocracies, that's sort of the more, maybe the most important division line. So there are some few countries where the classification is less certain. The confidence intervals overlap one way or the other. Um, so we just want to mark that and, and, and be open with that, but some of them are more uncertain. But if we disregard the uncertainty a little bit for a little while here first, this is how the picture looks like for the last 50 years. The way of democratization first uh, led to a lot fewer dictatorships um, and more, more democracies, but also a lot more electoral autocracies. A lot of countries went from close dictatorship, democratized a little bit, but didn't become democracies. So that was for a long time the most common regime type in the world. And then Towards these last, at least decade here, we see um, these two democracy trends diverging. So fewer liberal democracies, more elec uh, electoral democracies. Liberal democracies become less democratic, turning into electoral democracies. That's the democratic backsliding part of the story, right? But also this here now a downward slope of uh, electoral autocracies and up on closed autocracies. Uh, and that's autocracies becoming worse. That's the other part of the story. You can look at this population-wise, and here we have the, the gray zone countries as well. Um, and here it's, from that perspective, more like 20 years when the share of the world population that is living in uh, one or the other form of autocracy is um, uh, increasing uh, significantly. Um, up from 50% to now 71 living in non-democracies. So that's kind of depressing. Um, we've known for a while that freedom of expression is often what wannabe dictators attack and undermine first, 
And it's also those types of indicators that um, uh, point uh, decline the most. So both media freedom, but individual expression as well, and then civil society is voicing uh, views. Right? But now, in this year's report, we also see that elections are really starting to be um, undermined to a much greater extent than we've seen before. So here is how the data looks like. So we go down from the index level to the components of democracy and different indices for them. This is 10 years ago. 2013, clean elections, and it's very simple metric. The number of countries statistically significant and substantially meaningful improving or declining on these indices. It's just a count of number of countries. Clean elections at that time was improving in 23 countries and declining in only 10. Right? Above the line, things are getting better in more countries than it's getting worse. Okay. Compare that to the situation in 2023. Boom. And worst of all out there, as we know, freedom of expression getting worse in 35 countries. But now also clean elections has moved down and out here, getting worse in 23 countries and better in only 12. That's a, like a 180 degrees flip from 10 years ago. Oh, what are the trends with regime change? So <clears throat> we now see 60 countries at present in episodes of regime transformation. So that's the, the new methodology we've used, spent some five years developing that methodology, eventually got, sort of validated it through the uh, 20th century and into the 21st century, where all so lots of case validation of things, and now it's also published in one of the top journals, Journal of Peace Research, last year. So now we brought it into the Democracy Report. It's more, much more rigorous and sophisticated than, than uh, the previous methodology we used for the Democracy Report. Um, it's also more, a bit more conservative. It's harder for countries to qualify as autocratizer or democratizer. Um, and out of that, 60, 42 now are democratizing and 18 democratizing. Um, of course, some of us remember this period here in the mid-90s, <laughs> when we were happy. Yeah. 70 countries democratizing at the same time. Frank Fukuyama wrote The End of History, and we believe it, right? <laughs> oh, no, man, but it was hope, right? Um, and then by this metric then, at least somewhere around here again, about 20 years, but could be longer, maybe even 30, um, number of countries democratizing, falling rapidly, and especially from around here, number of countries autocratizing in steep incline. There's a little bit of a dent down there, and a little bit up here. Um, it could could mean that this wave of autocratization has crested. Right? Um, but we want to be careful we're not drawing that conclusion yet. Because with the ERT methodology, countries can start changing here, but the change doesn't accumulate so that we are certain taking the uncertainty measures and confidence intervals into account. We're not certain that this is not just measurement error, right? So it needs to <clears throat> really um, accumulate to um, to a statistically significant extent. And we'll come back to that, but there are 25 what we call near misses here. Countries that have started to change in the last few years but the change has not accumulated enough for them to reach that threshold, to be classified here. So, but if, if just a handful of them continue worsening, then this number will quickly change upwards in the com coming two or three years. Um, so that's a cautionary note on 
interpreting that last part. It's all over the world, right? Um, we have countries in Europe, Africa, and Latin America, and uh, uh, South and Central Asia, and all the way over to Southeast Asia. It is a global way. Um, and that, I think, needs to be considered when we think about and theorize about and do research on what are the drivers, factors leading to this. Um, they, they suggest that there should be at least some global factors for a global trend. Now, up to 35% of the world population live in these red market countries. Um, significantly up in the last 20 years. It's also, yeah, the number of countries are going up, the number of share of population, everything is um, getting worse. And here's another perspective of, of this decline. So, right, so out of the 42 autocratizers, uh, some of them started as autocracies already, and were getting worse. Um, but 28 were democracies when the autocratization started. And only about half of them remained democracies. So fatality rate of about 50%. Um, which should make us feel a little bit worried when we see new democracies entering autocratization uh, and their, their their prospects of staying democracies. But as I said, we, with this new ART methodology and then studying autocratization over these years, realizing that, that the picture is becoming more and more complex. And there are these two sort of, we think, very different processes of autocratization. You have the standalone cases, which is sort of what we've been thinking about until now, mostly. In the sense that, you know, a country is at whatever level of democracy. Think India for many years, sort of democratic, nothing changes much, everything is okay. And then Modi comes into power and things fall down. And it's sort of standalone. It comes from nowhere. Has, right? um, and then the bell turn. You can think of as failed democratization. Countries that were moving up, doing well, and then in one process start to turn around. There's no like stable period in between, and and they sort of hang together as one episode. Um, so standalone autocratization, um, it's about half half in the sample of those that are right now ongoing. So that's another. Another advantage with the ERT methodology compared to our earlier method that we can identify the countries that are where the process is still ongoing and hasn't ended. Um, here's a top ten list uh, that you don't want to be on. The countries in terms of magnitude of change, right? Uh, the ones that have changed the most among those that are now ongoing. Greece. Poland, Mauritius, Hungary, India, Serbia, Hong Kong, Comoros, Afghanistan, Nicaragua. And with the ERT, we can trace all the way back to where they started um, and when the process started. And we see that they started at very different levels. They have sort of right now, not ended, but are in very different places. Um, they also have different lengths, right? Nicaragua starting in 2005, Mauritius 2018, and a much more steep decline. Um, so we can analyze, start to analyze these differences and similarities. Um, <clears throat> may note that only two remain democracies as of yet, with Greece and Poland. Now Poland, with the opposition win there, we hope things are turning around, at least Donald Tusk and the government are doing what they, what they can, it seems. Um, but it's a, it's a very, um, what's to say, um, different set of countries. The same with the bell turns, the failed autocratization. So, again, they start at very different levels. They also sort of end, as of now, 
at different levels. Um, and uh, some are more sort of almost upside down V, like Armenia. Um, others more like bell shaped, and, and others even more stretched out. Um, country like El Salvador, right, had a very long, slow, incremental process of democratization, which by the literature should be a good thing. Slow democratization is better than quick. It makes for more democratic stability, but not in the case of El Salvador, Bukele, and uh, fighting crime and getting rid of civil liberties, organizational freedoms, and, and so on. Um, and I, <coughs> again, um, most of them turning into autocracies here, um, and we see where Indonesia and Armenia uh, are heading. <coughs> so we think that these cases of failed democratization um, are particularly interesting type of cases for us to study, match and compare with cases of democratization that continued and succeeded, if you like. Um, because that type of comparison should be able to give us some clues as to why these guys failed. Um, and also among these autocratizing countries, uh, it's uh, very evident how this um, the elections getting worse uh, is playing out. And, and that is a bit worrying, I think, because it seemed for a long time that many, many leaders in countries that were sliding back on democracy held back from undermining and attacking elections. Of course, some did, some have always done, but it seemed that many of them, there was some resistance to it, whether that's international norms or other things, I don't know. But now there is this increasing trend, and, and very marked this year, in um, uh, uh, leaders and parties undermining also this core institution. And that shows, oh, if we drill down into the indicators, uh, here is among the autocratizing countries, the indicators that have changed the, for the worse, statistically significant, uh, in the most countries. And <clears throat> worst of all, government censorship of effort, of the, uh, effort to censor the media, uh, CSO repression, so on, but also EMB autonomy. Just like Modi in India, beginning in 2019 with that election, starting to get hold of the electoral management body, getting it under control for their own purposes. And this is, um, a few years back, the EMB autonomy was, was not nowhere near being on the top 10 list here um, among autocratizing countries. So that's something new. Uh, then there are other aspects of elections that are also being undermined, but not in as many countries. Okay, but there's some good news, right? We need some good news. Um, yeah, they're getting fewer, but they're still 18, okay? Um, and with democratizing countries uh, this year, everything is nine. Um, oh yeah, sorry. First, just compare the percentage, the five percent of the world population in these countries. And half of that is Brazil. Um, so they tend to be fairly small. Um, but um, everything is nine. There are nine standalone, and then there are nine U-turns, the opposite to bell turns, right? Um, and then I will come to it, there are also nine, what we call near misses. So nine, 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 yeah. Um, standalone, democratizing countries. So here you also have a, a kind of a, a different, very different set of countries and some going on forever, like Timor-Leste, also Solomon Islands have been gradually, gradually democratizing for a long time. Others shorter and more steep, like the seashells, or now Lake Honduras and Fiji. 
Um, and uh, they are now all classified as electoral liberal democracies. Uh, these are all the nine cases that are still ongoing. Of course, there have been other cases in the previous years, um, but we don't look at them in, the, in, this, in this report. Um, also, nine new chart cases, and these are, you know, maybe even more interesting than the Bell term, because they are cases of stopping autocratization and not only halting it, but also turning it around. Um, not necessarily reaching up to the levels you were before, but at least some up, uptake there. Um, again, a wide variety of cases. Um, Brazil's recent turnaround stands out for one um, reason. It, it stayed a democracy all the time. Bolsonaro never managed to get it into the category of of autocracies. All the others have gone down and been autocracies for a short while, like Zambia, General Maldives, and Lesotho. Um, and this, I think, is a, um, a hopeful finding because it means that even if countries slide down to electoral autocracy, not everything is lost, right? It can be still be turned around, sort of against all odds. Um, uh, a lot of observers didn't think anything could, it, it would be possible to turn things around in Zambia, but with popular mobilizations, civil society coalescing with um, unified opposition parties that really mobilized for that critical election and managed to turn it around, lots of international pressure on the incumbent to accept that and step down and so on. Um, that it, it is possible. And this with the U-turns is something we saw for the first time in the data last year, with last year's report. Then we didn't really have the methodology, we didn't have the ERT and the development of the ERT that we've done this year to uh, be able to systematically identify these U-turns. But over this year we've done that and we also did um, this uh, academic working paper then that we're sending out for peer review any day now. Um, and then we identified all cases of U-turns since 1900. There are 98 of them. And that was till end 2022. Um, and there were only four cases that stayed democratic through the U. So this finding that Brazil is very exceptional, that's the fifth case now since 1900. And that again, I think, is, is hopeful, right? They, 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 you can't turn around. And this really astonished me. When we looked at this systematically and saw that half of all autocratization periods were actually turned around within a short period of time. Again, a hopeful finding, and that percentage has even increased a little bit here in the last 30 years. Um, so, of course, we don't know if this is going to continue. There is no natural law out there saying that half the process has become U-turns. Um, but at least a little bit of hope with regard to all the 42 countries that are right now in process of autocratization. Um, yeah. This is available for download if, if you like from, from the VDM website. Okay, and then this last section, Windows to the Future. First, we have these what we call near misses. This is not so much for <coughs> our academic purposes, we think, because um, if you think of it this way, okay, you need to move from here to here to be classified as an autocratizer. They have moved halfway or further, but it's not statistically significant yet, right? So, of course, none of our journals or anything would like it or would allow us to publish anything based on that. So it's like, okay, forget it. But maybe it's some, the policy practitioner community here in DC, they're very interested in these because it's sort of kind of 
early warnings a little bit. We need to maybe consider putting in some more efforts here to see if this can be prevented from turning into real autocratization. Here are the top five right now in terms of, again, the magnitude of change. So these are very close to the threshold. Um, South Africa, Georgia up there, and then countries further down the scale, Ivory Coast, Mozambique, and Gabon. Um, and it's, I think, also um, significant for what is happening in the world, or telling about what is happening in the world, that even these near misses cases, many of them have been going on for like many years, as South Africa, 10 years, and still haven't, haven't gone down so much that they qualify to be sort of um, classified as autocratizers, but still move. But it's so incremental, so slow change, bit by bit. It's like that, um, and it, it, it's, it's, it's like it took Orban about 10 years to dismantle democracy in Hungary. It took Erdogan about 10 years in Turkey, a little more actually, 11 or 12. And that's how, that's very illustrative for how autocratization happens in, in, in today's world. And that's very different from how it used to be, the 60s and 70s and, and the first wave in the 30s and 40s. Okay, there are also, yeah, I said that nine miss, near misses of democratization. Here are the top five. You have a couple of countries up there, high up, but um, then uh, Nepal, Kenya, and Malaysia down here for a few years have been moving up, and it's looking positive again, sort of for the policy practitioner community. They're like, okay, so maybe we should put extra efforts to supporting democratic developments in Malaysia. Malaysia, Kenya. Um, um, I mean, it could be if for, for comparative case studies, perhaps, if one want to start tracking a country uh, that's early in the process and see how it unfolds, could uh, be sort of a, a means of selection of, of finding those cases. Then we have this, finally. Um, the year of election, 2024 record number of countries holding elections, record share of the world population being involved. Um, and I've heard many people talk about this as a potential make or break year for democracy, and that we should really worry about 2024. And I think we should. We have 60 countries in the VDEM data that are holding national elections this year. Then there are a few microstates we don't have data on. 31 of those 60 are in declining context. Um, and only three in democratizing countries. So here's how it looks. Um, real autocratizers, if you like, the standalone and the bell turns, 20 of them together. And then there are 11 uh, of these near misses of organization, where the elections could really be make or break in terms of turning them into real autocratizers or not. Um, the only three are on U-turns. And then we have this other category where we, we don't see any sort of trend movement one way or the other necessarily right now in the last four or five years at least. But it doesn't mean that those are sort of safe countries. Um, um, there's some really contested, worrisome cases there too. Uh, let me mention one, United States is in that category. On that happy note, <laughs> um, this is the Democracy Report this year. Everything is available from our website, including the data if you want to download 31 million data points and run in your, uh, with your R code, um, go ahead. If you don't want to do that, we have these graphing, online graphing tools, uh, so you can dig into there and access the data and do analysis without 
um, without being skilled in, in R. And let me say thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. All right, let me just pull the chair up here. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for that. I think uh, I, I would just say, um, in general, this is all uh, super important research. And I, I think, uh, you know, in my opinion, this is the most authoritative ongoing effort to assess levels of democracy. And uh, they provide so much data. And one of the great things about it is, as uh, Stefan mentioned at the end, is that the data is available for other people to play with and um, do your own analysis. Um, and I also think in general it's probably one of the most successful, if not the most successful, general data collection efforts over long periods of time in the social sciences. I mean, there are a lot of kind of one-time data sets, but ones that have been collected and generated so much use by the field more generally. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll take the liberty of asking a, a first question, um, which uh, I mean, you concluded uh, by talking about all the elections being held uh, this year that are of consequence, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, and that makes me think of some of your um, original uh, very <laughs> important work uh, on uh, democracy and elections in Africa, um, you know, where the finding was, at least at that period of time, that the holding of elections, as I recall the argument, um, by non-democratic regimes itself was a, a force for democracy. And so, um, you know, I wonder, just like, kind of thinking back to that period and, and what's going on now, um, mm. do you think something, as it, do, you see, do you still see just the holding of elections as still potentially a force for democratizations, uh, or has something changed that, uh, you know, maybe under current circumstances for any reason, autocrats are now able to use this to their advantage? Um, or is it still something that maybe they put up with and do for some reason that maybe still carries some level of risk and, and democratizing uh, mm. potential? Mm. No, I think um, I, I think that uh, both autocrats in you know, say leaders in autocracies and wannabe dictators in democracies have learned their lessons. So my original study on Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, 48 countries, and that period stretching up to, you know, 2004, um, that was a period where um, there, you know, in the wake of uh, the collapse of Soviet Union and all that, and, and, and the spread of multi-party elections to many places where it hadn't been or hadn't been for a long time, and there were lots of miscalculations by, by incumbents um, and being overtaken by events. Um, so I think those findings, uh, I mean, we, did, we, we have done a little bit, and of course, for my own fun, and looking back with the VDAM data, if, if, if you were sick to that sample or that period, it still sort of holds. Uh, but what's happened is that the non-democratic uh, forces, if I put it that way, have learned to use elections to their advantage. Um, so I think it's a learning story. Um, and um, unfortunately now we see that the elections are also their integrity being undermined more and more. Um, uh, so, and I, you know, as scholars, we know this, and we should always look out for it when we find relationships that those relationships may change over time, right? Because we are learning human beings, and they are as well. Okay, great. So let's open it up. Um, questions, uh, comments? Yeah, please. And just I'd ask to introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Daniel Duffy. Um, and what I want to know is what kind of, how are we historically kind of contextualizing, especially in the past like 10 years, this kind of surge of authoritarianism? So when we go back to like 1989, the Soviet Union is collapsing. Um, there's less of those communist dictatorships in place. Um, the West is less likely to back up dictatorships like Pinochet, Mobutu, or you know, any number of those guys. 
Um, in 2012, you have the Arab Spring, the Arab kind of monarchies kind of hold together to prevent democratization happen happening. Between then and now, what trends are we seeing that are kind of externally affecting those countries that are uh, autocratizing? So, can I rephrase that and see if that you, the question is, what is driving this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah, globally. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> That's the one billion dollar question again. <laughs> but we have a couple of days to discuss this. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, my take that's partly based on research and sort of established um, and, and partly, say, impressionistic and, and intuitions um, <coughs> goes something like this in a short version. Um, Okay, we, this current wave of autocratization, whether we talk about the last 20 or 30 years, it's almost exclusively driven by far-right parties and leaders that are nationalistic and reactionary. Kaz, who's coming here, I suppose, but say they are populists, but that depends on the definition of populism that's anti-pluralist is included. There are many populists, I would argue, that are not anti-pluralist. But the key here is that they, um, I mean, previous waves there have been, of autocratization, there have been lots of left-wing uh, parties and leaders and declarations of one-party states, and you have it. But now it's almost, exclusively far-right, nationalist, reactionary, anti-pluralist. Um, and very, very many of them get elected in relatively democratic elections and gain support. And some of them continue to gain support, as you know, your program here, uh, a number of them are there. We can discuss how much support Putin still has, it's hard to know. But at least for a long time, he seemed to have a ton of support. Um, so there is more and more micro-level evidence suggesting or supporting, corroborating that um, people who perceive a relative deprivation um, coming from now this in enormous spread or increase in relative inequality in the world, in all countries, started in the 1980s with the policies and then rolled out through the Washington consensus to the global south, and later has gone very far. We have record levels of relative inequality in Sweden. Um, the debate about whether it's like record in the, the last 75 years or the last 150 years, okay, but it's record levels. Um, and people who will feel affected by it. <coughs> you can add in there, of course, we've gone through some finan deep, deep financial crises and we've also had a pandemic, stirring possibilities of fear for the future. And the micro level evidence for the people that perceive that fear either in the sense of you know, the standard questions are like, if you think your prospects are, are worse than your parents' generation, or you think your kids will have worse prospects than you have, they have a much higher propensity to support and vote for these uh, uh, anti-democratic parties and leaders. Um, and then, throw into that, then, since around 2000, um, we've had the spread of the internet and then build up of social media that gives an enormous uh, capacity to spread disinformation and stir polarization. And the evidence in the data is so clear. S these 
uh, anti-democratic forces spread disinformation a lot. And once they ascend into power, that increases enormously, along with then building up polarization um, through that disinformation in, to a big extent. And that becomes a tool of autocratization. Um, because when you can use that space for disinformation to start to build up to portray the political opponents as enemies, enemies of who we are, have you heard that? Enemies of the nation. What do you do with enemies of the nation? and you get people to believe that they are enemies of the nation, then they will be behind you for curtailing their civil liberties, close down their civil society organizations, shut down their media, take it over, just like Orban has done in Hungary. With support. Um, and then Putin has helped this all he can since he came into power, first in the form of Soviet republics, then and sometimes violently, then he, every far-right extremist party and grouping in the whole of Europe, for example, has had financial and strategic support by Putin, right? And then we have the, his own pro-fabrics and meddling with the Brexit and the other the US elections and other elections. That's a sort of supporting force, if you like. Then you add to that that China didn't at all like what happened in the 1990s. And they decided in 1995 that hegemony in the world for the communist model is where should be our ambition. And then she made that plainly clear in 2017, explicit, um, and have been undermining democracy and, and freedom, if you like, in any way they can, uh, increasingly in any part of the world they can. They're also trying in Latin America now. That doesn't help, okay? Um, and, and let's not forget about the Saudis. Again, starting in the mid-late 1980s with the oil money, um, spreading Salafism. They used to be this mi microscopic part of the Muslim world. Um, it's as far away from democracy as you can come, right? Um, and has now become a sizable part of the Muslim world. And even in, you know, in Indonesia they have problems, right? Which didn't used to be the case. Um, so that is another force that has been sort of spreading anti-democratic sentiments uh, uh, in many places of the world. They don't have the same goal. The Chinese doesn't, and Putin doesn't, they, they have different goals in the end but they're all sort of against democracy. And, and all of this plays in the hand, and of course the far right, they can argue, use this to, to be uh, uh, anti-Muslim sentiments, and Im, you know, an immigrants, it plays into this mix that the, these anti-democratic or anti-pluralist parties can use. Um, somewhere there, at least some of the forces, I think, are involved in making this a global way. Okay, yes please. Uh, thank you so much. I was planning to ask somewhat the similar question. But, uh, Just identify yourself. Please. Of Irina Zaslavska, I used to work in IFIS, International Foundation for Election Systems, for 30 years studying the same thing, elections and all that, and then and ran, not now I'm just independent control. Um, I think uh, returning to the most important question, what happened in this U-turn? What exactly was the reason? I think we're kind of missing the biggest elephant in the room, and it's, uh, you mentioned, let's say, Hungary or Russia. I think we have probably the first time in history when people actually massively, on a large scale, really made their real-life experiment. They tried. Um, I left uh, St. Peter in 91, so all the 90s and this nightmare, which you can 
probably, I don't know, find the tragedy of Russian reform, Peter Redway or somebody like that. They're describing the experience with, with people equate with the moment when, according to all these, you know, parameters, it was democratizing or democracy. They actually experienced it that some the most horrific episodes of the, you know, disarray in the society. I mean, you could not undo this experience if they, and I think it's ingrained so deeply that, of course, you're right to look further, starting with 2000 or late 2000, other reasons, external and all that. But I think underlying all this, it just absolutely simply didn't work for so many people. And my question was, did you try to run parallel when we have, you know, the uh, definitions, clean election or, you know, independence or EMBs and all that, which we did at my work, parallel to that, we were doing the public opinion surveys. And, you know, if you look at the 90s in public opinion in Russia or Kazakhstan or Ukraine, when they supposedly democratizing, people hate this. According to the free Levada Center, so they really didn't like it. So I think it correlates opposite way to what they equate with the, and I think based on that, very easy later to do other things which you mentioned. So, um, first of all, would they agree that it just didn't work in the beginning for this country which with such high hopes came out of the post-Soviet experiment? Mm -hmm. And um, a second minor, like when you say clean elections, I'm just curious, when you give it pretty standard definition, but let's say Ukraine, because we were observing 2004, uh, 2010, which was cleanest election in Ukraine, yet in 2013 he was obviously deposed. And, uh, so how do you equate your clean election definition, let's say we did my office and all that, uh, was pretty decent election, and then he disappeared in the public appraisal. So would you agree that the verdict of public on the clean election really <laughs> mattered there, or some other forces were more important for, you know, movements of such scale. Anyway, sorry for a long, but I think the most important, what do you think how to, I actually didn't finish, how to undo this experience that people actually remember from their lives, let's say, in the 90s. This is what I think driving a lot of those forces. Yeah, well, sorry. My thinking goes like this. So it's just, we we don't we don't do almost any work with using popular opinion service. That's for other people to do, and mm -hmm. we have enough with this. Um, uh, doesn't mean, of course, that we think think pop, people's opinions don't matter. Of course they do. Um, but it's just a division of labor kind of thing. Um, so, but. But I think what you, you know, if it was only shock therapy, to, for lack of a better term, um, in Eastern Europe and former Soviet republics um, after the end of, uh, or the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, then this wouldn't be a global trend, and it is. Um, but what you're describing is uh, falls into what many people discuss these days, which is the dissatis dissatisfaction with democracy, how it delivers. Right. And and then we have the economic side of it, of course, with the with the fast transition um, for former Eastern Europe and and Soviet Union. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about the, the, that democracy hasn't delivered uh, enough right. in Latin America and parts right. of Africa as well and so on. And, and that I think is, um, it's, it's in the same ballpark of popular reactions that I also talked about with the experience of increasing relative inequality, fearing for the future, about your prospects and your children's prospects. Um, and, and that also gels historically with what happened in the 1930s, um, that 
turn the most democratic country at the time, maybe, uh, the Weimar Republic, into uh, the worst form of, of dictatorship in four years. Um, so I, I think there are many reasons to agree with you that um, people's perceptions of whether the system delivers for them to, or works for them and make their life better and the prospects into the future better is a really part, an important part of the equation. Now we happen to know now that democracy in the long run delivers much better than dictatorship. Better economic growth, better health care, uh, infant mortality goes down, blah, 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 all health <laughs> indicators, it's very clear. Um, it's, uh, de democracies are better at producing public goods from electricity to safe water and so on. You can go down the line. They take often a long time to materialize, one, and two, uh, they often materialize at the higher end of the democracy spectrum, sort of a curved linear relationship in many cases. So for many countries, when democracy is not delivering, it's not because of democracy, it's because they don't have good enough democracy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I do think uh, uh, that we have a lot of work as, as scholars to do a better job in uh, uh, providing uh, good analysis of, of this area. Um, I'll say, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean with the clean elections and people's verdict. I mean, people make their verdict whether the elections are clean or not in, in some way or the other. Oh, I just meant that it was a prize of the guy who was cleanly elected, like in Ukraine. Yeah. That's what I mean. He was thrown away after a very clean election. So yeah. He won. Mm -hmm. Democratically, that's what I yeah. mean. Um, um, okay, that, that happens. Every now and then. Um, they also throw off dictators every now and then. Yeah. Um, so, um, but if if we, I mean, there's there's no doubt that a, a democracy, a functioning democracy, needs clean elections. Okay, but my clock, we only have like oh. about three minutes left, but maybe we could just take like the last two questions if we could try to state them briefly and. Uh, one there and then up okay. here and then ask um, First of all, thank response. you so much for a wonderful presentation. My name is Maxim Kupsky. I'm a human rights defender from Russia, and currently I'm a research scholar at the Canon Institute. I'm working on research uh, dedicated to foreign agents legislation and it, uh, its analogs and the impact on civil society. So my brief question is, uh, to what extent do you agree that the process of uh, decline of the democratization and uh, so so-called authoritarianization or autocratization of the world is a result of the atomization, social atomization in uh, uh, different countries and the loss of the sense of civic and political agency uh, of people, even in democracies. So why people lost the trust in their civic engagement because as you mentioned before the democracies they rule by people so people should be engaged in this process and so why they choose dictatorships for example or autocracies instead of their own direct participation in um, in uh, the civic and political processes so what do you think uh, about the impact of social atomization and even in democracies Maybe we'll just collect like the left. Maybe I saw one more. You can just collect them. Try to be brief, and then you can respond as much as you uh, can fit in. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Matt Boyce, I'm a former Foreign Service. I now teach at Johns Hopkins Science and here at the PW and American University. Um, I, um, to, uh, you mentioned that you changed the methodology of the student you were studying. Hey, hey, could you just give us a, you know, for those of us who haven't like, gra grappled with all this complexity, just why you did it and how it, you know, how, 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 what, what, what differs this year from the previous year? And then could I just ask also, you've used a semantic question, so uh, terminological. You uh, use the word, well, you, appear, you use the word autocracy, authoritarian, and, and dictatorship almost not quite interchangeably, but you, you use them all in describing this phenomenon. How are you distinguishing between you know, uh, these various concepts? Uh, are, since there obviously seems to be preference for use of the term autocracy, 
then you also use the word dictatorship on a number of times, which is also like pretty much the same thing in many respects, and authoritarian. Like, how, how are you dealing with these various terms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how one more, yeah, just, yeah, I mean, please, yes, very yeah, briefly. Paul, Paul Wong, I'm a researcher from Taiwan, Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation, doing opinion polling and public policy analysis. Uh, just one thing that, that, that's lingering in my mind, when you mentioned about this year being the, the main break here for democracy, and also, having so many elections, therefore, you seem to be suggesting, well, if, if the outcomes of the election turn, turn out to be some candidates we don't like, then that's a break of democracy. Uh, I don't know if that's what uh, you, you, you imply. Uh, to me, I think um, what should be evaluated as institutions so the people could vote with someone who is illiberal or autocratic tendency, but that doesn't change the liberal nature of the or illiberal nature of the institutions. Uh, so the election outcome shouldn't change that. It should be the process. Uh, that's just one thing, one one feedback. Thanks. All right. The remaining few minutes are yours. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. The remaining thirty <laughs> seconds. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, uh, Maxim, was it? Uh, um, I don't know if you call it social atomization. And again, I, I don't, I don't do a, any research on, on myself on micro level data, and just refer to some of the studies that I find very convincing and rigorous in that regard. And if that's social atomization, or if that's really, I'm, 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 I'm not convinced. Specifically about that, um, um, I think uh, that um, misleading in by disinformation plus the real sort of socioeconomic conditions that make people fear future make them more probable to be convinced by anti-pluralists. Hey, I'm going to save you. The big strong man is going to save you. Um, methodology, yeah. But, um, why? Because it's better. Um, <laughs> and, but but differences, like so, with with this methodology, we can um, we can say whether they're still ongoing or they've ended. We can trace them back exactly to when when the process started, establish the length. So we can do a lot more, and we can even trace these U turns and belt turns that we couldn't do before. Um, so we can do a lot more sophisticated analysis with it. And it also has more, much more precision in saying whether a country is autocratizing or democratizing. So it's sort of algorithmic then, or, or yeah. how, you, how you actually you've got the same data sets that you've always used, never not changing that one, to one bit. It's just that you're just racking and stacking them, or you're able to manipulate or whatever. Uh, whatever. Yeah, it's right. Like, or more yeah. interesting uh, uh, conclusions from the data. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, when I speak, I'm a little bit careless with the use of the different terms, so don't take me too literally there. But in the report and much of the work that I'm involved with, we work with this typology. If we work with sort of categorization, then we work with the category, the, the differences between liberal and electoral democracies and electoral and closed autocracies. So, and the closed are sort of pure dictatorships, if you like, right there. There's no pretense even of So a dictatorship being the, the, the absolute worst of the uh, yeah, yeah, categories. Yeah, or the and, then, closed and, then, and then got, okay, but how are you distinguishing between authoritarian and autocracies there? Sort of, which is, which is I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, on the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. In, in my research, I don't use the word authoritarianism anymore. Because? Because it's a, okay, and that's a long story, but, but authoritarianism is the, 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 um, I mean, it's it's similar in the sense that the, what we used to make a distinction was between authoritarian and totalitarian, but that's about their ambitions more than their actual functioning. Um, and totalitarian systems have an ambition to sort of change everything, including how um, you, what you teach your children and 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 what you think about the world and make new be human beings and all that visionary sort of ambition. Um, and, and there are very few of those regimes left in North Korea. Uh, I don't know if Cuba has that ambition anymore. 
uh, Iran maybe, um, Af uh, Taliban in Afghanistan. But, um, and then authoritarians that are loser, as long as you don't threaten their hold of power, they're fine. The sort of Linsian um, idea there. Uh, but the world has changed and um, the, um, is, none of these typically held any elections. But then what happened was that, um, I think Larry Diamond first theorized about it, that there are all these non-democracies that hold multi-party elections and seek to have trappings of democracy. Um, and then that's led to this sort of new conceptual typology, and and that's that's the one I work with most of the time. Um, congratulations, by the way. Um, but no, this is not about liking a candidate or not for policy reasons or whatever. But it is a fact that. Certain parties and their leaders are anti-pluralists and want to be autocrats. And if they are elected into power, they start undermining democracy. And that's, in that sense, the outcome matters. Um, that's how it started in Hungary with Orban. That's how it started in India with uh, Modi. And we can go down the line. Um, that's why we talk about the 2024 as a make or break year. It's sort of putting things in stark terms, it's a little bit of policy, practitioner language. Um, but as long as all the parties and their leaders in a political system are convinced Democrats, committed, blah, 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 then of course it doesn't matter who wins from a sort of democracy perspective. It's all about the procedure should be right. But the procedures can be right, but can be used by anti-democrats to take over the system and do away with it. And that's the point. All right. Well, I'm afraid on that note, uh, yeah. maybe not so positive, but we'll have to end on it. Uh, but thank you so much for a really great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.